Elden Ring draws from a variety of influences. There are references to Greek mythology, Norse mythology, Christian stories, Berserk, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, previous FromSoft games, and much more. But by far the most profound influence on Elden Ring's story is from the Hermetic tradition, an ancient tradition involving elements of astrology, numerology, mythology, and most importantly, alchemy, which is the focus of this video. In order to do justice to this complicated and esoteric topic, I've divided this video into two parts. In the first part, I cover some of the real-life history, imagery, and foundational concepts from Western alchemy to provide some context for the symbolism that appears in Elden Ring. Then, in the second part, we'll take a look at Elden Ring itself to understand how the symbols and concepts from that tradition present themselves. While the historical context for these ideas is very interesting to me personally, if it's not your cup of tea, feel free to skip to the second half of the video. As a disclaimer, I should say that I'm not a historian, an anthropologist, a scholar, a chemist, or an alchemist for that matter. I'm just a lore junkie, with an interest in the history of alchemy and its influence on popular media, so take everything I say with an appropriate amount of skepticism. If you know the subject matter and you think I've really got hold of the wrong end of the stick, please correct me in the comments below. Without further ado, let's begin. Alchemy is an ancient practice that goes back at least 2,000 years. Our modern discipline of chemistry couldn't exist without the early experimental practices of ancient alchemists. Today, any child can order a chemistry set online and conduct a fairly rigorous experiment, but in the ancient world they didn't have access to industrially purified elements or reliable high-tech equipment. The sciences were in their inception, and discoveries or advances were only made by especially curious individuals experimenting with whatever was available. The early alchemists discovered that certain metals and materials had unique properties, and they believed that by understanding or modifying these properties, they could unlock the secrets of the natural world. Many alchemists believed that their practice was a very serious and potentially dangerous exploration of the unknown, and as such, they hid their work behind layers of allegory, coded language, and obscure symbols. That way, only the initiated would be able to decipher it. But this code was never standardized, from country to country, century to century, every alchemist had their own system, which made it much more difficult for later generations to unpack these esoteric works. 19th century Europe saw a sudden burst of fascination with all things occult, partly as a response to the stifling, prudish culture of the upper class. This interest in the occult targeted the historic texts of alchemy, among other things, but the people of the time were less interested in the mundane chemical experiments and more interested in the mystical side of alchemy. The allegorical language and mythological symbols used to hide the meaning of older alchemical works was interpreted from a more spiritual or psychological angle. There isn't one authoritative version of alchemy. Over the millennia, every alchemist has had their own worldview influenced by the context of their time. At times, alchemy was nothing more than experimental chemistry, a craft with the mundane and practical goal of producing precious metals on demand. At other times, it took on a much more mystical bent, with loftier goals of spiritual transformation. While there's much more room for nuance in the various types of alchemy than can fit into this video, there are some consistent through lines in alchemical thought that can help us to understand alchemy's influence in Elden Ring. By far the most important concept in alchemical thought is the role of duality. On a basic level, everything in the world can be reduced to a pair of opposites. The mundane and the divine, light and dark, good and evil. In alchemy, the concept of duality was always tied to another concept, the unity of opposites. Every pair of opposites is unified on some level. Heat is the opposite of cold, but they both describe temperature. Cohesion is the opposite of separation, but they both describe the relationship between things. The existence of anything implies its opposite. Light can't exist without shadow. A similar idea is contained in the yin-yang symbol. 
Within chaos lies a seed of order, and conversely, within order lies a seed of chaos. We'll encounter these themes of duality and unity in all of the following alchemical concepts. Let's start with the classical elements. In alchemy, everything in the world could be expressed in terms of the four classical elements, earth, water, air, and fire. The symbols for these elements reflect the themes of duality and unity that I just mentioned. Fire is the mirror image of water, and air is the mirror image of earth. The elements can also be divided into mundane and celestial pairs. Earth and water are pulled downwards towards the terrestrial realm, whereas air and fire reach upwards towards the heavens. These elements were also often classified by their properties of temperature and moisture. Fire is hot and dry, air is hot and wet, earth is cold and dry, and water is cold and wet. This system of categorization was the foundation for all alchemical processes. Alchemists believed that by rearranging these properties in a compound, they could transmute materials from one form to another, such as changing base metals like lead into noble metals like gold. The four classical elements weren't considered elements in the way that we think of elements, like on the periodic table. They were more like qualities or aspects of matter. In a way, they were ahead of their time. There's an inherent progression built into the classical elements that anticipated the progression of molecular activity in our four Newtonian states of matter. Earth as solid, water as liquid, air as gas, and fire as plasma. Fire, in particular, was of the most interest to alchemists for its unique transformative properties. Fire and heat make substances volatile, which allows them to be more easily changed or combined. Alchemical processes made frequent use of fire, and alchemists sometimes even referred to themselves as fire worshippers. Even today, almost every chemical process involves heating a mixture to combine various components. That brings us to the next major concept in alchemical thought, separation and recombination, often referred to by the Latin phrase solve et coagula, or dissolution and coagulation. There are hundreds of different processes used in alchemy, but at the heart of every alchemical formula is dissolution and coagulation, alternately dissolving a stable substance into a volatile mixture and coalescing a volatile mixture into a stable substance. The duality of these two complementary processes was often associated with the duality of fire and water. A mixture would be subjected to a hot flame, eroding the boundaries between the different components and allowing them to blend together. Then the flame would be removed and the mixture would be allowed to cool, sometimes with water added to help the components separate into discrete parts like a thin film of oil condensing on the broth of a cooling pot of soup. This idea is very important, so keep it in mind as we continue. Fire and heat as a way to blend things together, and water and cold as a way to separate them apart. The themes of duality and unity, dissolution and coagulation, can be found again in the primary elements of alchemy. In addition to the four classical elements, which describe something a bit more abstract, alchemists had a set of material elements that made up all the compounds found on Earth. The central figures in this set were sulfur and mercury. Sulfur was associated with heat, fire, masculinity, and the sun, whereas mercury was associated with coolness, water, femininity, and the moon. Mercury was also of particular interest to alchemists because it's a liquid metal, in between categories, so they thought of it as representing the transition between different states, especially the states of life and death. Mercury and sulfur could also be combined through something called the Law of the Triangle to produce a third important element, salt. The three of these made up something called the Tria Prima, or the Three Primes. In this conception, each element was associated with an aspect of humanity as well. Sulfur as the soul, mercury as the spirit or mind, and salt as the body. 
In addition to the abstract symbols we've looked at, alchemical processes were often represented by images of animals or mythological creatures. These images weren't arbitrary. They were always chosen because they represented some aspect of the chemicals involved. For example, ammonium chloride is a white salt with volatile properties, so alchemists might represent this with a white eagle, because an eagle flies in the way that ammonium chloride volatilizes. Similarly, nitric acid is corrosive and produces red fumes, so it might be represented by a red dragon. If an alchemist's formula involved adding nitric acid to an ammonium chloride, he could depict this with an image of a red dragon devouring a white eagle. Birds are a common theme in alchemical images, and they have multiple meanings. On a material level, they could represent the evaporation of gases from a heated liquid. On a more spiritual level, they could represent the spirit being freed from the body, or transcending to a higher state of being. The black crow, or raven, is a common image, representing death and decay. It's often connected with two very different alchemical processes, calcination and putrefaction. Calcination involves heating the substance to just below its melting point, burning it to a black mass, whereas putrefaction involves fermenting the substance. While these two processes are very different, they're both associated with something called nigredo, which I'll get to in a little bit. Another important bird in alchemical imagery is the phoenix. In mythology, when the phoenix reached the end of its life, it would combust and be reborn from its own ashes. As such, in alchemy the phoenix is associated with fire, rebirth, and the freeing of the spirit from its physical limitations. It's often used to represent the final stage of an alchemical process, and sometimes stands in as a symbol for the Philosopher's Stone. Taken as a pair, the raven and phoenix could symbolize the stages of the magnum opus, the process by which the Philosopher's Stone is created. Another common symbol in alchemical imagery is the lion. There are two lions that frequently appear in alchemical images, the red lion and the green lion. The green lion represents a compound known as the vitriol of Venus, a sulfuric acid that was thought to dissolve any metal besides gold, and as such it was often depicted attempting to devour the sun, which was a common symbol for gold. The red lion, on the other hand, most often represented red sulfur, another name for the philosopher's stone. Another symbolic animal is the gray wolf, which represented lupus metallorum, what we now refer to as antimony. Antimony was considered an agent of change, as when melted it would easily combine and form alloys with other metals. It was considered similar to mercury in that respect, and both could be used to symbolize the successful production of the Philosopher's Stone or the starting material required for the process. Finally, the sun and the moon are some of the most common symbols in alchemical imagery. Most often they represent gold and silver, but they could also stand in for heat and cold, or fire and water. The sun also represented the soul, the unity of all things, expansiveness, sulfur, the completion of the alchemical process, and many other things. The moon, on the other hand, could represent the mind, the night, the process of separation, reflection, mercury, and so on. As you can probably tell, there is a great deal of ambiguity in alchemical symbolism. Nowhere is this more true than in the object that fascinated alchemists throughout the millennia, and for which alchemy is most famous today, the Philosopher's Stone. There are many different versions of the Philosopher's Stone. It's sometimes described as a rock, a powder, or a liquid. Some versions describe it not as a physical object at all, but rather the end stage of a spiritual transformation, resulting in a perfect unified being called the Ribis, represented by a male and female head attached to one body. The Philosopher's Stone was said to be able to transmute base metals like lead or tin into noble metals like gold or silver. It was also said to cure any disease and produce an elixir of immortality. The formula for creating the Philosopher's Stone was called the Magnum Opus, Latin for Great Work, and it has just as many different variants. Some versions describe three stages, others four, 
five, seven, sometimes as many as twelve or fourteen. But across all versions, there is broad consistency. It's always a process signified by a change in color from black to white to gold and finally red. To begin creating the Philosopher's Stone, you need something called the Prima Materia. What exactly the Prima Materia is, is elusive at best. Almost every account describes it only by analogy and metaphor. It's the substance common to all things, the primitive essence of matter itself. Some interpretations theorized that it could be mercury or antimony. But whatever it is, it's placed inside a large egg-shaped flask in preparation for the first stage of the magnum opus. The first stage is called Nigredo, or the black phase, symbolically represented by a black crow. The flask containing the prima materia would be placed in a furnace and cooked steadily for weeks until it reached the desired state, a blackened mass. The black coloration and decomposition of the cooked material lent Nigredo an association with decay and putrefaction, represented sometimes by skulls or corpses. Once the mixture became a blackened mass, the second stage could begin, a stage called albedo, or the white phase. In this stage, the flame is reduced and the substance is allowed to cool somewhat, and it begins to separate. Sometimes water is added to help with the process. Albedo was often represented by the moon or stars appearing in the black night of the Nigredo. The light of the moon is reflected from the sun, which was emblematic of the separation of the substance into two opposing parts, represented by the sun and moon. These parts were sometimes called the Red King and the White Queen. The various stages of the magnum opus would often be repeated until the desired effect was achieved. This would sometimes require the use of a device called a pelican flask. A pelican flask is just an ordinary flask with two hollow handles on either side, connecting the bottom and top of the flask. The idea is that heating the flask would cause the mixture to evaporate, and the evaporated gases would condense at the top of the flask and run down back into the mixture, the cycle of solve et coagula in practice. Following the albedo stage, the original conception of the magnum opus included an extra stage here called citrinitas, or the yellow phase, but later versions integrated this into the final stage called rubedo, or the red phase. Either way, the end result would be heralded by a change in the mixture's color to gold and then red. Red was considered the true color of gold. The appearance of gold in the mixture was thought to be expansive, like sunlight, but by condensing the gold mixture and heating it further, it would take on its final reddish hue, the deep blood-red color of the Philosopher's Stone. Finally, the compound would be tested in a hot flame, a flame hot enough to melt almost anything. Only the Philosopher's Stone would remain stable in fire. At this point, you've probably started to connect the dots and piece together some idea of how these concepts relate to Elden Ring. So now with a grasp of the basics of alchemy, let's take a fresh look at Elden Ring's lore through this lens. References to alchemy can be found throughout Elden Ring. Some of these are more surface level, like the visual similarity between the Eye of the Fell God and the famous Ripley Scroll depicting the magnum opus, but some are more significant, like the parallel between the alchemical principle Solve et Coagula and the laws of causality and regression, or the gravitational powers of the Onyx and Alabaster Lords, respectively. On a broader scale, the entire map of the Lands Between seems to reflect the various stages of the Magnum Opus. Kaled is afflicted by rot, and the Red Mains have taken to burning the land to keep it at bay. The land is terrorized by massive black crows, the symbol of Nigredo, the stage of the magnum opus that's associated with decay and burning. The next stage of the magnum opus, Albedo, is symbolized in Liernia, which is covered in water and crowned by an enormous moon. This is where the White Queen of the Moon, Renala, and the Red King of the Sun, Radigan, were married. Following Albedo is the yellowing, or the gold color of Citrinitas, represented in the Altus Plateau and the golden light of the Erd Tree. The Erd Tree is eventually put to the flame, turning it red for the final stage, Rubedo. 
Color in general is an important theme in Elden Ring, with each color being associated with a fairly narrow and specific meaning. Gold is the color of the current order, the color of the Elden Ring, the Erd Tree, Grace, and Runes. The smaller and weaker rune items are faded and pale, like the eyes of Millicent Sisters or Melina in the Frenzied Flame ending, whereas the more powerful runes are vibrant and take on a reddish hue, like the primordial gold of Ordovis' sword. Red is also the color of the Scarlet Rot, certain types of fire, blood, and your health bar, all oddly related ideas. Dark blue is reserved for the night sorceries of the Selians and Primal Glintstone, whereas a lighter shade of pure blue is used for the sorceries of the Carrions and Crystallians, as well as the magical sparkling effect that occurs when Rani or Melina appear and disappear. Regular Glintstone sorceries are blue-green, as are the distinctive spirit tuner eyes of Roderica and the Rani doll, and the Comet Azure sorcery. The other two primeval sorceries are an indigo color, somewhere between the dark blue of Selian magic and the deep purple of gravity magic. It should be noted that one way to achieve a blue-green or indigo color is by mixing together an alloy of pure blue with gold or red, respectively. A particularly interesting use of color is in the various types of fire found in Elden Ring. There are debatably eight different types of fire, perhaps connected to the eight circles in the eye of the fell god which orbit its central pupil, or the eight-pointed polar star. Each of these eight types of fire is a specific color. The pale blue ghost flame, the lavender-colored fires of slumber, the vibrant red and orange of the flame of ruin, the deep dark red flames of the rune of death, the colorless black flame, the golden black flames of the Prince of Death, the pure gold fire of Placidusax and the Elden Beast, and the sickly orange-yellow of the Flame of Frenzy. In alchemy, different colored flames would only mean one thing, a different fuel for each fire. If the same principle applies to Elden Ring, it could give us a clue as to what distinguishes these types of fire from one another. A flame of pure color, like that of the Elden Beast or the Rune of Death, could indicate a pure fuel, whereas the additional tint of another color in the flame, like the Flame of Frenzy or the Prince of Death, could indicate an impurity in the fuel, an alloy. But there's more to fire in Elden Ring than just its color. Fire is a central theme in Elden Ring, just as important a force as it was in the story of Dark Souls, but there are two key differences between the way fire is portrayed in these games. Dark Souls was concerned with fire itself, its qualities like light and heat, and also the absence or opposite of those qualities, dark and cold. Elden Ring appears to be more concerned with what fire does to something, how it erodes boundaries like the Flame of Frenzy, or purifies that which is decaying like its use by the Red Mains in Kaelid. But there's a more fundamental difference between these two representations of fire, in Dark Souls, fire represented civilization, the vitality of the current age. Once the fire goes out, a new age will begin. In Elden Ring, it's the exact opposite. The system we're presented with when we arrive in the Lands Between is completely opposed to fire. The new age is instead brought about by the introduction of fire into that system. Or perhaps it's the reintroduction of fire, because fire used to play a role in the Lands Between that it no longer does. It was only after America defeated the Fire Giants and sealed away their flame that the Age of the Erd Tree began, which makes sense because fire burns trees. Before the Erd Tree existed in its present state, it took the form of the primordial crucible. Now, crucible is an interesting word. In one sense, it describes a physical object, a large bowl used in alchemy to melt substances on high heat and mix them together, an object which looks remarkably similar to the Forge of the Giants. But a crucible is also something else. It's a test or a trial, an ordeal in which the strength or purity of something can be proved. Gideon tells us that America has high hopes for us tarnished, that we continue to struggle unto eternity. And we certainly do struggle. In our search for the Elden Ring, we struggle against a myriad of countless foes, and if we prove ourselves in that crucible, we absorb the runes or grace of each slain enemy. That grace comes from the light of the Erd Tree's branches, and eventually that grace will return with us to the roots of the Erd Tree, fused into our body as runes turned into strength. 
Like a pelican flask circulating a mixture through the stages of evaporation and condensation, the Erd Tree circulates the spirits of the dead throughout the lands between, in the form of runes or grace, hoping, perhaps, to purify and coalesce these honeyed rays of gold in a tarnished who can prove their strength to become Elden Lord. The Erd Tree is the heart of the Golden Order, an order whose insignia is the Elden Ring contained within a triangle. This is clearly inspired by the Triquetra, which is sometimes used in Christian symbolism to represent the Holy Trinity, but unlike the Triquetra, the triangle in the Golden Order's sigil points downwards, which happens to be the alchemical symbol for water. There are many odd connections to water and death in the Lands Between. Godwin's Fishtail, the Spirit Jellyfish, the Boats of the Tibia Mariners, the Ainsel and Shifra Rivers which transport coffins, and more broadly the entire Lands Between may be some sort of interstice or purgatory separated from the rest of the world by a sea of fog. More importantly, water is the antithesis of fire. The heat of fire blends things together, incinerating all that divides and distinguishes, whereas the coolness of water causes things to separate. The Golden Order was founded when destined death was sealed away, a rune which, when unsealed, resembles a putrefied black tree root consumed by a blood-red flame. In a cut line of dialogue from this cutscene, the narrator says that black flames have devoured the Erd Tree, a reference perhaps to the true power of the black flame that was lost when Malekith sealed away destined death. Perhaps the black flame and the flames of destined death were once part of the same fire, now separated from each other. Considering how we get to Faramazula and why we're there, perhaps the giant's flame of ruin also once had the same origin. This is all just speculation, but one thing's for sure. The lands between, under the Golden Order, is an extremely divided place. The Golden Order is described through the laws of causality and regression. Those laws define the pull between meanings and the convergence of meaning, the forces of separation and unification, or in other words, the alchemical principle Solve et Coagula. That principle is embedded into the history of the Erd Tree itself. In its primordial form, it was a crucible in which all life was blended together. But when fire was sealed away, when this alchemical process was allowed to cool down, things began to separate, like oil and water. The tarnished were exiled from the lands between, and the world entered a divided state in which the unique identities of people, objects, and forces were split apart. Ultimately, the Tarnished would return for the final stage of this alchemical process, repairing the shattered Elden Ring and restoring the mixture whole with the application of fire. If this alchemical analogy is accurate, it begs the question, what's the point? What's the end goal of this alchemical formula? Why would the Greater Will, or Merica, subject the Lands Between to this process of disillusion and coagulation? In order to address that question, let's take a look at Merica herself. When we finally confront Merica near the end of the game, she appears as a woman crucified beneath an enormous crescent. One way we could symbolically represent this image is with the classic symbol for female with an upturned semicircle on top. This is the alchemical symbol for Mercury, and Merica shares many of the same symbolic associations as Mercury. Merica and Mercury are associated with the mind, the transcendence of life and death, and they both form one half of a pair of opposites. Mercury's counterpart was Sulfur, and Merica is similarly complemented by Radigan, who, like Sulfur, is associated with masculinity, fire, and the soul, the object of faith. Mercury, representing the mind, and Sulfur, representing the soul, could be combined through the law of the triangle to produce salt representing the body. In similar fashion, Merica and Radigan are combined into a single body. This union resulted in the birth of the Empyrean twins Mikola and Melania, but it wasn't the first marriage for either parent. Both Radigan and Merica had previous spouses, Radigan with Renala and Merica with Godfrey. Merica's children with Godfrey suffered from some problems. Moog and Morgoth were afflicted by the accursed blood of the Omen, excluding them from the grace of the Erd Tree. Godwin the Golden appears to have escaped unscathed, but even he wasn't chosen by the Two Fingers as an Empyrean, 
a candidate to succeed Queen Merica as god of the coming age. An Empyrean did eventually appear, but not a child of Merica. Instead, Rani, daughter of Radigan and Renala, was chosen. It's debatable whether Radigan was somehow part of Merica at this point. Personally, I don't think so. Either way, there was something special about the union of Radigan and Renala that produced a potential god, something that wasn't achieved by Merica's union with Godfrey. The wise beast Muriel, pastor of vows, refers to this union as a miracle that conjoined the order of the Erdtree and the fate of the moon, a miracle that will once again mend the world. Radigan and Renala bear striking resemblance to the alchemical Red King and White Queen. In alchemical thought, the sacred marriage, or Heros Gamos, of these two figures would produce the hermaphroditic Rebis, the perfect being and personification of the Philosopher's Stone. Radigan and Renala's marriage perhaps came close. Radon, symbolized by the Red Lion, which represents the Philosopher's Stone, proved himself as the strongest of all demigods, who even in his youth was able to conquer the very stars. Perhaps Merica observed Radon's incredible strength and Rani's Empyrean status and sought to appropriate the power of that pedigree for her own purposes. Whatever the reason, Radigan was summoned to the base of the Erdtree to become Merica's consort, a union which produced two Empyrean children of incredible power. Despite the prestige of these twin prodigies, Mikola turned his back on the Golden Order because he found a flaw within it, an impurity that left his sister Melania to suffer from her accursed blood afflicted by rot, a scarlet rot that could only be kept at bay with flame. Mikola was perhaps the closest to an alchemically perfect being, displaying hermaphroditic qualities, eternal youth, and godlike power, but his design of unalloyed gold still ultimately failed. The Halig tree, watered by his own blood, never grew into an Erd tree and was consumed by rot. He himself was abducted by his stepbrother Moog, another child of Merica who, like Melania, was afflicted by accursed blood. Deep beneath the blood-drenched battlefields of the rotting Ionian swamp, Moog attempted to raise Mikola to full godhood and become his consort, under the auspices of a mysterious outer god called the Formless Mother, who bestows power upon accursed blood by setting it ablaze. He ultimately failed, however, because Mikola was either dead or just unresponsive, a perverse end to Merica's most promising child. Merica's first litter of children produced a pair of twins with cursed blood that would burn with a ruinous blaze if not sealed away, and so she cast them out, imprisoning them deep beneath the earth. Her golden child, Godwin, appeared to be almost perfect, but even he couldn't become a god, and ultimately proved to be mortal. Perhaps it was in an effort to save her children that Merica sealed away the ruinous blaze of death. After Fire's influence was diminished from the world, Merica gave birth to another pair of twins, but their blood was also cursed. Without the influence of Fire to keep it at bay, Melania's blood rotted, and her body decayed. Mikola's blood was pure, but it lacked the fiery red vitality of life tested in the Crucible, leaving both him and his Halig tree stunted, unable to mature into godhood. In a world where fire is sealed away, a tree can flourish, a tree that represents the order of the world. But fire has a purpose. It's the crucible of a tree. It's the test of a tree's vitality, and only a deep-rooted tree can survive that test. On the other hand, if not burned away, dead wood begins to rot. The fallen leaves tell a story. A story of a great tree with summery branches that once nourished life in its youth, and now in autumn casts its dead leaves to the ground. Some people might observe this rotten world and wish to restore fire at the cost of everything, burning it all to the ground. Others might wish to escape the iniquities of life altogether, choosing instead the barren frost of a dark winter. Others still, struck by the futility of resisting the course of nature, might wish to take revenge for this dark cosmic joke, cursing the cycle of life itself and all who are a part of it. 
At the heart of this stagnant world is an ancient woman, who despite being a god that should have lived a life eternal, recognized that her time was soon ending, and that the world faced a new age. As the lands between was subjected to a grand alchemical experiment, Merica herself attempted a more personal form of alchemy, the creation of a perfect child, a god for the budding spring of a new age. The Newmen, a race of which only the women are known, are long-lived but seldom born, and Merica, almost certainly a Newman herself, may have faced the same challenge, difficulty in conceiving a healthy child. Both of her marriages resulted in children born cursed, a curse notably absent from the miraculous, loving marriage of Radigan and Renala. The grand quest of alchemy, the magnum opus, the search for the Philosopher's Stone, is a pursuit of perfection and a path to achieving immortality. Merica followed that path, but in her own way. She sought an immortal legacy. After all, what is having children if not a form of immortality. Thank you for watching this video. The conclusions in this video are highly speculative. Any discussion of alchemical symbolism in Elden Ring is prone to a wide variety of interpretations, because symbols are inherently ambiguous. The goal of this video was to use hermetic ideas to address, in a somewhat narrow way, the central narrative of Elden Ring, and in doing so I've left a lot unexplored. I didn't talk about the symbolism of iron and the misbegotten, or platinum and the albinorix, or phosphorus and moog. I didn't address astrology at all, or the imagery of snakes and eagles, or the connections to Kabbalah, the tree of life, and the path of the flaming sword. A few things I vaguely alluded to, like the phoenix and raven in regards to the twin bird, or the symbolism of the gray wolf, but I'm going to take a leaf from Miyazaki's book and leave all these as clues for you guys to explore and piece together on your own. The influence of alchemy and occult practices in popular culture is a fascinating rabbit hole that never ends. I don't claim to be an expert in this area, but if you'd like to learn more about it, you might enjoy these books that I found very engaging while researching the topic. The Forge and the Crucible by Mircea Eliade, The Secrets of Alchemy by Lawrence Principe, and The Occult by Colin Wilson, a book that, by the way, rests on Miyazaki's bookshelf. One of the great things about the FromSoft games is how the people in the community come together and bounce ideas about the lore off of each other, so I'd like to shout out a group of content creators that I've had the distinct pleasure of speaking with over the last few months. There are too many names to list here, but some you may be familiar with are Ratatosker, Aridin, Xyostorm, Smotown, Sinclair Lore, and many others. In the description for this video, I've included links to some of my favorite videos from each of these creators. If you're not familiar with some of the names listed, please check them out. They're all wonderful people, talented video essayists, and they each have a unique perspective on the lore, which is really the point of the whole thing. Finally, if you like this channel, please consider subscribing, and if you really like this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I've also created a separate channel for streams and extra content called Munchie, which you can also find the link to in the description for this video. Thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you next time.